sir at uh, Apollo Guru Nishwa. I'm the moderator for today's sessions uh, on webinar, and I would like to welcome you all for the webinar for this IPAG in the form of knowledge exchange and insights on various aspects of patient safety with involvement of global leaders. This is an excellent week, which has inclusion of pre-conference workshop, apart from conference on 23rd and 24th February this year in Bangalore. It would be wonderful to meet you all in the conference, which will strengthen patient safety network with your participation. Please register by logging into the website www.patient-safety.co.in, which has entire details. Today's webinar is about uh, building a resilient and crisis-ready healthcare system. Creating a resilient organization is a challenging task, which is the need of the every healthcare system, given the fact that COVID has given us lessons in the recent past. Crises are internally stressful and often involve uncertainty, unpredictability, and increased work intensity. And so we need a meticulous plan for facing such situations. Now I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Mr. Raja Rajan is a powerful blend of a visionary leader with a global perspective and a strong business acumen. He was operating as a MGM uh, in, uh, in the capacity of Chief Operating Officer and has achieved 350 plus crores PNL annually in FY23 with the business transformation capability of uh, moving it from 212 crores in two years. He has been leading ventures in India and abroad on various aspects of multi-speciality, organ transplant, oncology, cardiology, diagnostics, and health techs. He has led various organizations and has driven JCI, NABH, and QAI. He is a member of CAHO, an American College of Healthcare Executives, the Research Foundation for Hospitals and Healthcare Administrations, and various societies like Telemedicine Society of India. He has completed his executive uh, general management program from IM Trichy after his master's from Apollo Hospital, Chennai. He is a visiting faculty in various industry forums, university, B schools, and colleges. May I request Mr. Raja Rajan to sort his talk with slide sharing, and also would request the participants to put their questions in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alok. Uh, all able to see my slide? Uh, yes, your yeah. slides are visible. Uh, you just need to be a bit louder, uh, Mr. Raja. Yes, perfect. So today we're going to be uh, talking about the topic, building a resilient and crisis-ready healthcare systems. And uh, thanks first up to Apollo Hospitals Group uh, for bringing together wonderful professionals in the field uh, for the 11th uh, International Patient Safety Conference. Uh, so if you look at uh, India, India has been the founding pillar of uh, medicine with respect to Charaka Samhita and Sushruta Samhita being the earliest documented uh, literature available for practice of medicine. Today, we have really come a long way be it uh, with cyber knife or Da Vinci robotics, or even with uh, the proton therapy. So having come all this far, what are we also need to be aware of is that in the last five years, especially, especially from the year 2019, 2020, we have seen that the world has changed as we know it, right in front of our eyes. Uh, you know, we went from a polluted city to a clean city overnight during this pandemic. We saw bodies in bags. We saw people whom we consider healthy, people who are like Ironmans in, you know, in various such world championship programs, also succumbing to these kind of pandemic diseases. So what is health? How does these healthcare systems be resilient? It's always a challenge. But we are uh, living amidst times of challenge, and uh, which is uh, very well established through the VUCA world concept, wherein we talk about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. 
Now, the perfect way to counter that would be to have a clear vision, a deeper understanding, a, a clarity from the right set of leaders as to what the objectives are, and the agility in which we will undertake achieving this uh, objectives. So today, uh, before getting into resilience, we need to look at uh, something which the World Health Organization has put out for us, which is the, uh, sorry, the United Nations has put out for us, which is the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, being resilient stems from this. Now, what we are going to look at uh, during the course of slide is also two particular aspects, uh, which is uh, number three, good health and well-being, and number nine, uh, resilience in industry, innovation, and infrastructure. How does it translate into healthcare, and how do we achieve it? And what about the various resilient theories and uh, the safety factors and various other aspects related to that? Today, when we set out to achieve the sustainable development uh, goals or even trying to be resilient in our healthcare settings, one of the important things which we need to really look into is uh, the aspect of stakeholder management. Today, we are not, many people do not understand who are all, uh, who all formulate these stakeholders. Uh, we have multiple stakeholders. We have seen it even when we do a PESEL analysis. But here we, you know, uh, taking that uh, from what uh, the theorists have said, into healthcare, patients are our most important uh, stakeholder providers, the doctors, the nurses, various employees, are all the next uh, set of stakeholders, payers as in the insurance companies, the government uh, who is paying for some of those suppliers, regulators, as in the government, communities, competitors, media, special interest group, and consumer agency group. These are all forming the remaining part of stakeholder. To be resilient, you need to understand your stakeholders perfectly. If you understand them, you would be able to strategize your plans according to that. Okay, so as we go, resilience. So quality plays a very important role, you know, through the various uh, accreditations, we are actually preparing ourselves to be resilient. If we look at uh, the continuous quality improvement programs or the quality indicators that which we accumulate uh, month on month and show improvement upon, these are all setting things right for us with respect to uh, resilience and crisis management uh, times. Accreditation process is well uh, known to everybody. We've all been through that. I'm sure uh, all the audience have gone through one or the other accreditation process. Uh, uh, the importance of adhering to these quality standards makes us more resilient. Uh, you have a plan and you stick to the plan. We'll be seeing about that uh, in the coming slides. And also these quality accreditations uh, with uh, the blessings of uh, international standards of uh, interest standards for quality, SQUA, gives us a global benchmark for healthcare quality and patient safety. And there's going to be a lot of discussions over the weekend as well. And uh, the importance of international recognition and best practices are another thing which many of the uh, high rated organizations or uh, premier healthcare organizations of the country has taken it upon them to get those kind of accreditation certifications per se. Next is uh, the important aspect of risk management. This again, though covered in quality as a part of, uh, whereas there is a whole lot of things you need to do with respect to risk management. It starts with getting a risk register in place, understanding uh, the risk assessment and mitigation strategies, enumerating all the potential risks that you would face, uh, say, uh, at a billing level, what kind of risk that you face, at a uh, statutory level uh, related to, say, fire, building licenses, what kind of risk that you face, or even with each of your processes. Uh, it could be a, a basic a phlebotomy process, uh, what are the kind of risks that you would face, and how it could be addressed. So what are the uh, methodologies to address or mitigate these risks? What is the kind of training periodically that you are doing the, for the continuous development of the people involved with the processes? So all these comes into this aspect. Implementation of proactive measures. Actually, 
uh, the 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 bad thing about crisis management is uh, generally we are reactive now what we need to be is proactive set a plan so that we will be responsive rather than reactive that's where we need to get to a uh, rapid response to a surge in patient numbers or even to a disaster as such deployment of additional healthcare personnel and resources when required say there is a, a camp that you need to organize there is already full fledged numbers how do you tackle all this where could you pull resources out from where how you allocate so all these are a part of it the other important pillar of uh, resilience is uh, building or even uh, mitigating the crisis is building a business process continuity or a business continuity plan so there are various various things that which you can do to keep that in place now uh, definitely you need to ensure that you have enough uh, good enough strategies which ensure seamless operation during this crisis development of robust business continuity plans as i said integration of technologies so we need to see the thing is in operations we always talk of technology okay technology the digital transformation that which you have put in place need to come in aid at this point of time it is at this point of time your disaster recovery plan also has to be uh, in proper order so that you will service your customers or the seamless delivery of healthcare uh, system can happen a uh, continuity of critical healthcare services during emergencies classic example of this is uh, you know many hospitals uh, have a good enough uh, dg setup also have ups setup also have power from different sources uh, different electricity boards if you are uh, middle of uh, two cities you you could pull out uh, something like that which we did uh, early in uh, 2004 when i was part of apollo at amdavad so continuity of critical healthcare services during emergencies is very very critical uh, having the right uh, call numbers uh, to call so that they can come and assist you and help you mitigate the risk Uh, have like a fire order uh, displayed in places uh, establishing the alternate care facilities alternate vendors this is rightfully done in quality also no? we do have all these tie ups prepared all these uh, patient uh, in case of uh, service not available with us where do we transfer them in case of a service is down where do we transfer them so all these are part of the bcp business continuity plan which would help organization in, in a better state so the important aspect of disaster management as i said you know uh, you can't have a disaster recovery expert and say you, you're close to the computer crash right so the preparedness and response mechanisms for natural disaster and pandemic we we do all these uh, risk assessments we do all these disaster recovery drills so all these has to be in place the response teams need to understand what their roles are you know uh, during the covid we did see that there was a lot of stockpiling of essential medical supplies so post covid in one of the organizations where i was we literally reduced the store keeping units of our pharmacy and uh, uh, surgical items from 17000 sku's to 9000 sku's so periodically you need to make uh, these kind of things so that you keep your inventory uh, resilient and your supply chain management resilient and there needs to be coordinated efforts between government agencies and healthcare providers there needs to be timely evacuation and relocation in case of a higher bigger disaster uh, that's it so as we said uh, the two important uh, standard development goals that we are going to focus on this uh, uh, in this uh, presentation is going to be good health and well being which is sdg 3 it has about uh, 13 targets and 28 indicators uh, you could all read about it in detail uh, so if you look at it uh, you know enhancing uh, healthcare infrastructure and access this is something which uh, we always talk about in basic uh, need you know uh, have the right infrastructure be accessible uh, so this is what our uh, uh, ayushman bharat uh, is trying to bring in health mission is trying to bring in through the pmj which was earlier the uh, case so there are many people who are getting benefited out of this so the infrastructure is available accessibility is increased a lot many private healthcare institutions are also coming forward to give them so those who are not yet uh, they are getting the ayushman bharat digital mission route to bring all of us uh, back into the system promotion of preventive healthcare measures uh, the national rural health mission which is doing a phenomenal job with respect to this in the rural settings as well so if you look at the sdg 9 which is uh, to build resilient infrastructure 
promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Uh, I am not aware how many of you know about the green credits, which is uh, we, which are set to be rolled out uh, maybe from the next financial year. So, uh, like how we had the CSR, there is something called as the green credits. Every organization uh, needs to actually provide a ESG report. Many listed organizations like Apollo and various other listed healthcare organizations already have the ESG report uh, put up on the website. For many of you, you could go and have a look at it. It tells how the organizations have been sustainable. Uh, the resilience that which has been built in with respect to the infrastructure, the capex allocated for building it, and various other aspects uh, which fosters innovation. So again, in SDG 9, we have eight targets and uh, 12 indicators. So these two are like uh, some of the important things under the resilience and healthcare that I uh, for building a, a, a healthcare system uh, in proper order, we had built it. So investment in technological advancements in healthcare and development of sustainable healthcare infrastructure are all some of the things which we uh, are looking as part of the SDG 9. Say, for example, AIMS uh, had gone with green, uh, AIMS went green with uh, solar rooftop installation. Many of the hospitals, uh, we do buy uh, power purchase to, uh, you know, reduce our uh, power cost. But also at the same time, we, when we do this with renewable energy through, say, wind energy or solar, so we always uh, do a lot much benefit than go with a power purchase with a thermal energy uh, source. So a lot of things we could keep talking about examples and all this. But the most important thing about the, the core pillar of the topic is about the resilient healthcare model in which we need to establish safety one and safety two with respect to the quality, the patient safety and the culture of patient safety as such. So safety one focus on error reduction and prevention. Now, any accredited hospital has implemented stringent safety protocol checklists in surgical uh, check safety checklists. So we know we do have the timeout. We do have the uh, meropenem uh, provided as a uh, you know medicine prior to the surgery. So all these aspects are in place, you know, and we also keep a tag on uh, uh, the surgical site infections post uh, 24, 48 hours. So all these are already in place in healthcare accredited organizations, but a lot many uh, other organizations which are not yet into the bandwagon has to jump into that. This would also help uh, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, even uh, with respect to the antibiotic stewardship program, if we need to talk about. The implementation of barcode for medical administration is another way to, it focuses on error reduction and prevention before it occurs. And emphasis on understanding how things go right is about the safety two aspects. Uh, these are all from positive deviations and, uh, you know, near miss reporting. You know, it, we need to encourage as leaders, as, as, as healthcare workers, we need to encourage people come out with near miss incidents so that we'll have a better uh, uh, hindsight, a better uh, view of preventing all those. A near miss not reported is going to be the next accident. Now you are saved, but later you would be uh, this thing. You know, and uh, similarly, uh, how to do things right. A multidisciplinary tumor board aspects in many of our hospitals in the country or internationally. These are some of the best practices which can be uh, emphasized for building a good enough resilient healthcare system. Uh, the focus should be on system adaptability and learning from failures. For instance, uh, you need to emphasize on adaptability and continuous improvement, that which even many of our quality accreditation program does to us, to enhance us for patient safety and quality of care. So if you look at the just culture, you know, very many organizations have uh, done it. I've read uh, in the recent past about how just culture has been implemented uh, in uh, CMC Velour, which, uh, you know, reduces the human error, reduces at-risk behavior, and also uh, reckless behavior over a period of time. So what do you need to do? You console coach or you punish at each of these instances. So for everything, there is a plan. So that's more important to have uh, when you look at it from a patient safety uh, point of view. So the most important thing, I, I keep telling uh, about this uh, in many of my meetings, you know, workers planned and workers done. Our SOPs and what we actually do in reality, the, the variations in it is the primary problem uh, for us to be uh, handicapped in situations. 
So understanding variability in everyday work processes is very, very uh, significant. That's what the cornerstone of our lean systems management, the Toyota production uh, system, the lean methodology. Uh, you know, many healthcare organizations have implemented that in, and have been successful. Bridging the gap between planned procedures and actual. This is what audit does, you know. Uh, you have a SOP, whether you're following the, following the SOP, we, we are checking that gap. So that's an audit as such. Adaptation and flexibility to respond to changing uh, uh, course as such. So in this also, if you look at it, uh, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know how organizations rapidly started deploying telemedicine services. How we went on uh, contactless uh, healthcare uh, management systems. So a lot of good things, you know, even the simulation-based training for healthcare providers, which has been doing uh, wonders with respect to surgical outcomes as such, or even uh, uh, res rapid response uh, team for CPR or any other, uh, or a med team's uh, response. So these are all have helped us in uh, things. Now, the most important thing is a system level thinking has to be in place. You know, uh, I'm an ardent uh, follower of design thinking. So a system thinking makes us better because healthcare is so intricate. You know, you have more than 100 particular factors which could affect one particular process. So how do we, how do we ensure that all these are controlled or addressed so that you get the desired outcome? So that is very much important. You also need to identify and leverage points for system improvement. So this again, through quality, the continuous impro improvement projects, the quality improvement projects, uh, the operational excellence projects, they all help us to get better at this. Okay, developing and de de delivering organized change is another big area. So you need to strategize this organizing change because change management is very, very core of anything. You know, if you, if you don't have people who are ready to accept to change and move ahead with the organization, it is always going to be a challenge uh, with respect to building a culture of uh, quality and patient safety as such. So you also, we are talking of complex adaptive systems in different contexts when it comes to management uh, of healthcare systems. Now, how, how organizations have done that? See, the multidisciplinary approach by Kaisa Pamnante or even the uh, hub and spoke model of be it Apollo or Arvind Aika system, or very many organizations in, across spread across the country and the world has definitely helped in uh, addressing this complex adaptive systems at per se. So in summary, uh, the world we knew has changed. So we are into a new normal. We've had enough webinars on new normal. Uh, so we need to have a viewpoint on the SDGs, also on our dashboards on the other uh, side of it. We should not stumble on uh, the VUCA world concept, ra ra rather channelize our energy to VUCA trying to get on top of it. We have to manage our stakeholders, understand the stakeholders and manage them better. We need to have the right quality accreditations and certification. Just because we, what we do know currently is just because certain accreditations are available, organizations are going for it. Is, is it required for you? You know, so you need to have the right fitment on your organizational journey and then pick the right quality and accreditation programs for you. Uh, the regular risk assessment, mitigation plans, the various audits, the, the internal and external audits, the uh, uh, response, the closures of it are all going to be very important. Having a proper business continuity plan, there's nothing like that. A disaster management drills, protocols to be in place, variances to be understood, and address understanding the safety one, safety two, preventing errors, uh, reporting near miss as two examples which we saw, reducing variability and incorporating flexibility. We need to be agile. You know, that's when we are going to be uh, able to apply system thinking process to even better what we are currently able to do. Of all of this, the continuous staff training and skill development, you know, quality as a culture in organizations is much required. And at the end of it, uh, the community engagement and communication strategies, uh, what we are doing, what it means to us to serve the community and the people, how we are serving them. All this has to come together as a good enough communication strategy uh, from the leadership team. So thank you very much uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Here are some of the book recommendations. 
I uh, appreciate uh, what we have been uh, doing uh, as part of the patient safety uh, culture and this uh, conference as such. So it is all uh, that I have to say, uh, quoting Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So wonderful lines by her, uh, an anthropologist. Thank you very much for having me here. I'll take the questions at the end. Thank you, uh, Raja Rajan, for sharing your insights uh, in depth towards building a resilient organization. So without wasting uh, any time, I move on to invite our next uh, second speaker, Mr. Santosh Marathe. And uh, before uh, I hand over to him, I give a brief introduction about him. He has been working in the capacity of a regional CEO in the Western region at Apollo Hospital Enterprise Limited. He has a work experience of uh, more than 27 years in the industry of which 18 years is in healthcare. He has a career which has transcended across manufacturing, consumer goods, and healthcare. Santosh has been instrumental in multiple strategic advisory roles for building business alliances, project planning, service excellence initiatives, costing and pricing, physician compensation, revenue management, and IT implementation. He has been recognized and awarded in top 100 healthcare leaders by IFAI Dubai. He has been speaker in multiple national and international forums at Boston, Sydney, Amsterdam, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Dubai on topics of patient experience, supply chain management, patient-centric initiatives, costing and IT systems. May I request, sir, to start your presentation, please? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alok. The screen is visible, right? Yeah? It's visible. Yeah, yeah. So before we get into the overall presentation, just a quick snapshot of what we do at Apollo. We are the largest integrated healthcare provider in Asia. And as is depicted on the screen, I think we have multiple verticals looking into the hospital, clinic, lifestyle management, pharmacy, uh, project turnkey projects. We take a lot of turnkey projects in terms of uh, project execution. Insurance, there is a vertical, there is a telemedicine arm which looks into technology adoption. There is a knowledge city which uh, uh, dwells into all aspects of uh, curri uh, career curriculum and this thing. And there is an ASHA project which gets into cross subsidization of cost, which is much needed in terms of this thing. So this is a very interesting topic, uh, talking about resilience uh, in uh, terms of this thing and crisis readiness. So this uh, slide gives an overview in terms of the healthcare uh, features as to what are the enterprise risk which any healthcare entity may be exposed to. I think quite a few ones, natural and human-centric uh, disasters are something which are always dwelled upon from a healthcare point of view. And while COVID has passed us in two years, we are still contemplating whether COVID was a natural or a human-created uh, disaster. But independent of that, that's another discussion point at some other presentation. But there are multiple facets in which an healthcare entity can be exposed to risk. And as is evident, I think there are natural calamities, there are geopolitical crises which can get into this thing. Economic downturns of economy or a particular region can also get into the overall thing. Uh, and with more and more adoption of technology, as we see digital and cyber security is also one of the larger threat that we are seeing in the current scenario, where healthcare uh, definitely can be humbled down uh, in a fraction of seconds in terms of the overall working. Uh, reputational with uh, most of the areas in public domain, at times with social media and people are also trying to adopt to social media in a uh, slightly loose manner in, in terms of this thing that can get into multiple challenges. The regulatory changes can also get into enterprises risk at times. Fiscal discipline, which needs to be maintained, whether an organization is a charitable or a for-profit organization, this can also at times cause a lot of financial distress. And operational challenges, as we understand, the retaining talent, retaining consultants, continuity planning, which is very important. Raja Rajan also highlighted earlier in, in terms of continuity planning for the overall activities that has been talked about. So obviously at periodic interval, what is recommended is to undertake an enterprise risk assessment. There is one or two slides which we will touch upon in the latter part of the presentation. And as we will understand, because the enterprise risk are multifaceted, in each and every category of the risk, you need a subject matter expertise because you will have to take a deeper dive. And unfortunately, there is no luxury of time at anybody's uh, disposal and in such kind of calamities. And that's the reason it's always good to have a knowledge vertical, knowing and understanding and enhance understanding in terms of looking at what needs to be done for each and every parameter of this thing. 
uh, one important element in crisis management, as we always understand, is communication. I think communication is the ultimate key. We will dwell upon some aspects of communication in the latter part of the presentation. And the last and not the least important point is uh, buying from all stakeholders. It is very, very important to get a cohesive understanding. And as we all understand, healthcare is all about people for the people. So we deal with human beings all across the segment within the organization and we deal with patient care activities, which is all about human side of the overall uh, entity that we develop upon. So this is typically the health risk assessment framework, which is typically divided into three aspects of the overall framework. The first is the assessment of exposure of hazards, where we need to be uh, fine tuning and proactively understanding whether natural and human caused uh, exposures are uh, a threat to the organization. The second, once when the threats are known in terms of the source of the threat is known, the assessment of vulnerabilities again needs to be done in each and every vertical of the continuity planning. So whether it has an implication on my clinical programs, my clinical structure, accessibility to the patient, the behavioral norms, which again, because we are in the industry of human beings, obviously it plays a very, very important uh, norm. And as COVID has really shown the human side of the healthcare provision that we talk about. The disease profile, COVID was a classic example where I think uh, all of us got exposed very rampantly in the first phase itself in terms of the overall activity. Uh, environmental and occupational uh, vulnerabilities need to be looked upon. At-risk groups, those kind of elements need to be looked upon. And once when that is done, assessment of public health capacity. I think capacity building is a very important element because at any point of time, when you talk about crisis-ready organizations, obviously you need to think 10x or 20x or 100x times in terms of what you are doing on a day on day basis. That's the reason the prevention, surveillance, response and recovery, all four important parameters of capacity needs to be dwelt into in terms of readiness. Uh, I will spend a couple of slides on pandemic journey because there cannot be a great example other than uh, pandemic which all of us went through and great job done by the frontline workers in terms of the overall uh, inertia. I think uh, the first time when we get got into a pandemic emergency, I think we were uh, uh, unprepared, very ill prepared in terms of the overall first phase because it was still evolving. We uh, could not quantify, we could not codify what we are entering into. And obviously with the second phase and third phase, I think a lot of maturity came into the system, learnings came into the system. And as any other healthcare provider, ultimate goal was to look at contactless solutions. The more and more solutions that we could provide from a healthcare point of view, which will reduce contact points was the one of the inertia, which within Apollo also we spent a lot of time and effort into this thing. Another advantage for Apollo in particular is with 71 hospitals span India, we always had the accessibility of the best talent uh, within the thing and collective wisdom, as we always understand, is always better in arriving at some kind of consensus with those kind of elements. And um, one of the good point about COVID, so to speak, is occupational health of care providers got prominence. I think, unfortunately, as healers, we always take our own health for granted. But COVID was really a reality check where our own health uh, went into a little bit turmoil. And obviously, it got the due acknowledgement in terms of what we need to do as healers as a part of the overall journey. Repurposing of resources was one thing which most of the organizations really learned well. So whether it is infrastructure, whether it is people who were deployed, there were people wearing multiple hats, whether it is clinicians, whether it is administrators, whether there were people on the ground in terms of this thing. Uh, and with Apollo kind of setup and particularly Navi Mumbai from where we reside, I think one of our uh, obligations, so to speak, to the community, we are a quaternary care setup. So obviously the initial request from public health department was to take care of the routine me uh, medical health care facilities for the community. But over a period of time, obviously, the most of the hospital setups were exposed to in terms of their um, uh, non-readiness in terms of handling ventilated cases, complex cases. That is the reason. And another advantage what we had as a system, we had an ability to convert uh, cohorted units on the fly. So the whole air vent circulation that we have from negative to positive pressure points can be converted. And that was one of the advantage. And when we talk about crisis readiness, this is this kind of insight really comes in handy where the infrastructure is geared up in a way, such a way that in a couple of hours, you can really change around the overall pathways and uh, COVID was really a testing ground for, for those kind of parameters. And one of the thing in crisis, again, now, as we all understand, any most of the crisis that we talk about unless and until it is internal, it is uh, generic in nature. It is universal. 
Hence, it is better to partner with between public and uh, private partnerships with public health authorities, even your competitors. I think COVID was again a classic examples where independent of the competitive barriers, most of the competitors also reached and helped each other in terms of those kind of needs. And hybrid healthcare model is something which is still evolving. I think COVID has again taught us to move into ambulatory care uh, model, which is moving across very, very, and it is here to stay as we look upon the overall kind of thing. Another important element during COVID, what we had looked upon was the behavioral clustering. Cohorting areas based on their disease profiling was one of the thought process. And again, here the advantage being most of the IT enabled system have an ability to cohort this kind of data simultaneously as and when you do patient episodes. So these were a few of the pandemic journey insights that we had at that point of time. And obviously we did a lot of rejig as is evident on the screen. I won't get into detailing of it too much. But obviously, the infection control protocols, the overall uh, uh, periodic drills that we undertook for epidemic management were undertaken screening and then testing and then uh, getting into treatment, segregating staff, segregating patients, looking at the pathway of access were all being revisited. Another important uh, thing which was unique to the Indian subcontinent is uh, if anybody is uh, sick or ill in the family, people like to flood the hospital. There are attenders, there are family members, there are relatives and not allowing them is taken to be a very uh, uh, jubilant element from their point of view in a uh, not so nice way. So obviously there was a lot of emotional uh, barriers that we needed to break and that is where again IT enabled solutions came in very handy. That's the reason Apollo's 24 by 7 app was really strengthened to give the kind of scalability which was needed in terms of those kind of things. So virtual consultations that we talked about, virtual mode, calling system, all this became very, very handy in terms of adopting technology. So this is a slightly dense graph, but what we are trying to show over here is obviously process changes underwent a radical change. And as we understood between the first, second and third phase of COVID, most of the times it was getting into advisories, which were coming from public health authorities. There was a uh, multiple huddle groups which were working and one of the advantage again within Apollo is most of these huddle groups were pan-India and all this culminated into what we called it as a red book manual. So this red book manual as we speak in 2024 has undergone almost 20 plus versions as on date and obviously it continues to be evolved with new kind of uh, advisories that keep on coming in and the new kind of code mapping that we look into the overall activities. Uh, supply chain management was another area where we had to do a multiple rejigs into looking at the overall stock keeping units, whether it is pharmacy, ensuring continuity planning for uh, PPE kits or whether it is pharmaceutical items that we needed to do. And PP category advisory also underwent a change based on the role plays and the role categories of the staff. So a significant amount of time and effort again came into play and handy. And again, as when I talked about multiple stakeholder buy-in, it is very, very important that collectively across the board, like if we had 1300 employees, at any point of time, we wanted to circle back to all 1300 employees so that A, there is consistency in whatever is the pathway that we have agreed, both clinical, operational and organizational pathways that have undergone a change. So all those were touched upon at periodic interval. One of the bigger uh, takeaway from the COVID pandemic for Apollo as a proud uh, Apollo employee for all of us is the kind of agility which the team showed in, in terms of this thing. Uh, on the lower side of the chart, there are quite a few products and services what Apollo evolved during the COVID pandemic time. So the project Stay I was one of the project which was undertaken to reduce the burden on quaternary care hospitals where people just needed home quarantine. But unfortunately, in the Indian context, where people unfortunately uh, uh, stay in one bedroom apartment or smaller houses, quarantining people within the family member was next to impossible. And that's the foresight what Apollo team had. And that's the reason we created and tied up with hotels who were virtually closed at that point of time. And this was something which came in as a handy and again to reduce the burden on quaternary care hospitals. Flu clinic and recover clinic was a very focused, cohorted area that we started in terms of taking care of the flu clinic and post-recovery uh, patients uh, having lung presentations and those kind of things were handled successfully during the recovery clinic time. The red book manual I have already talked about. One of the lead again, as a private healthcare provider in the region, we undertook the lead in providing vaccinations. There were vaccinations which we had undertaken remotely in terms of the overall activities. COVID, non-COVID activities where bed management were undertaken, where within the same facility, we had to coexist having COVID and non-COVID patients. But obviously, based on the negative and positive uh, air vents 
there was an iron wall which was clearly dividing this thing. We invested a lot of time and effort in the resting time for our staff. Because obviously, as people were sick, so were our staff. And obviously, we needed to provide for those kind of things. So all these pathways were very well laid out, very well thought out in terms of this thing. Plasma treatment was something which Apollo again started, Navi Mumbai unit in that uh, particular thing. There was a lot of communication education that we undertook with communities and schools because parents were also restless in terms of this thing. And especially during the second wave where the overall implications on the kid was indicated to be on a higher side. That is the reason we took the lead in terms of enhancing standardized communication pathways. And overall, obviously there was project coverage where we did a lot of handholding activities with corporates where people were working from home, few were working from the office environment. And this gives a gist of whatever we did during the COVID time. And this is again the community engagement that I talked about. So for outpatient, inpatient, ER, which is a very strong uh, entry point of uh, most of the Apollo hospitals, where we created those kind of triaging system, different pathways for accessibility. Interestingly, what we also did is leverage the Facebook Live series very, very strongly. We involved the community office bearers, whether it is the chairman or the secretaries of housing societies, invited them to steer most common uh, knowledge base on particular COVID evolving trends to the community. And that was a good success giving us a reach element in getting into multiple activities and multiple facets of the community. So if you look at the resilient uh, framework, what how does it get evolved in terms of this thing in any cri uh, crisis management? The lower part of this uh, graph which shows is the overall element of designing the overall network, looking at sourcing strategy. Do you have the competent people who can be the torch bearers for any activity that you are talking about? inventory and planning, which is continuity planning, not only for the resources, but also ensuring that the most human capital part of it is also not getting compromised in the overall thing. And the product design in terms of how do you design new products, like the few of the examples, what I gave earlier in, in terms of the overall thing for COVID are very clear. And once when you are done with it, monitoring and uh, sensitizing it at periodic interval also is an important element where you need to get into predictive analytics. I think one of the things which we have learned the hard way during COVID time is also to improvise on predicting what can go wrong in terms of this thing. That proactiveness is very, very important in terms of handling with the crisis. Uh, and obviously the critical response in terms of how do you manage the crisis responses? Who will be communicating it? At what formal communication pathways you will get into this thing? That proactive planning and resource planning in terms of that communication also is very, very important. And uh, cultural fitment is another important element because again, we are dealing with human bodies all across, uh, whether we are providing care or people who are availing care. Both ways, uh, there are emotions, sentiments, behavior, which are at the highest fit in terms of this thing. And data analytics, again, I think because most of our uh, elements are IT enabled and we are an institute with a huge appetite for data, most of our data decisions are evidence-based in terms of this thing. And that's the reason that all these elements became very, very handy in terms of looking at that kind of uh, framework, what we were wanting to get into. So few of the elements which are critical success factor when you look at resilience and uh, crisis management, as I already said, I think communication, communication and communication is the most critical important element of this. At periodic intervals, the senior leadership should get into a structured meeting and structured uh, wherever possible, uh, those kind of uh, uh, meetings uh, should be conducted. Uh, the second important part of the communication is to keep people away from incorrect assumption and false information. Most of the people have the tendency to get into greasy meals, as we call it. So obviously, the sense of ownership of the leadership team is also to ensure that the right information reaches the right people at the right time so that there is no confusion, which may further add to the overall uh, crisis mode. I think that is something which can be avoided if you have a structured feedback and communication. In fact, we went to the extent in healthcare where housekeeping people in most of the times uh, English language becomes a challenge. Most of our communications were decoded again into Marathi and vernacular languages so that people do understand what is and why it is important for them to be staying disciplined to the pathways or any other approaches that we are talking about. Multidisciplinary team approach is something where uh, most of the initiatives, whether it is COVID or non-COVID or any other crisis that we talk about cannot be done in isolation. That's the reason it's better to have a multidisciplinary approach. A lot of inputs came from the clinicians as individual subject matter expertise. Internally, the biomedical team, the facilities team, the nursing teams, the housekeeping team, including the housekeeping team, the GREs who were on the ground, the pharmacy team members, all of them gave their respective feedback and nuances as to because these are the people on the ground and they know the business dynamics much better 
then we seeing it from an ivory tower. So obviously it becomes handy to get a buy-in from all these people. And one of the important elements during crisis is rapid feedback, faster decisions and change decisions. So once when you take a decision, as we all understand, as and when you take a decision, it's a moving target. It's not a fixed target. It's not a one-time activity which will be done and dust it for life. So obviously, we need to be vigilant in terms of monitoring whatever changes have been undertaken, look at the outliers, see where an intervention is needed. So that is an important mantra during uh, crisis management. And obviously, uh, one of the things, again, we invested a lot of time in teaching, training, reviewing, and or needless to mention, repeating the whole cycle again. So there was a periodic at periodic interval. And one of the things which, again, mental health as a subject really occupied a prominence during the COVID time. And not only during COVID, I think any crisis, different people have different ways of reacting in crisis. I think we are all human beings. We need to understand and acknowledge that very, very clearly. And that's the reason people need to invest very strong. Not every manager will have the same resilience to face any crisis. And that is where the hidden talent or hidden competencies of the people are known best when you are in a crisis mode. And that's the reason which uh, team collectively should start leveraging on those kind of points, investing in rightful people, repurposing resources, which is very, very important in, in terms of crisis management. Uh, and being a part of the healthcare, I think all of us need to understand primary healthcare uh, uh, facility or primary healthcare uh, vertical as a specialty has occupied prime, prime pro importance based on the disease profiling, based on the disease presentation, whatever we had. And that is something which works like a gatekeeper policy in most of the Western countries. But obviously in the Indian context, with the post-COVID, I think the prominence of uh, physician practices obviously has uh, occupied much more importance in terms of this thing. And for us also, as human beings, I think we also took our lives too much for granted. So it was more of an introspection for all of us also as a matter of reality check for this thing. And one of the thing in crisis mode, again, uh, being a part of the healthcare, all of us need to uh, ensure that equity of access and equity of care is being provided across the spectrum. And when I say this, I mean it for the healthcare providers. We ourselves need to have that equity of care being provided. Every staff is important, whether it is a housekeeping staff or whether it is a senior consultant or whether it is a nursing staff. And same thing applies to the patient and their families. The right hand side graph just gives a visual representation as to what happens in disruption. And as is evident in the graph, just before the disruption, if you are proactively looking at the risk assessment chart, that is where your whole segment of planning needs to be undertaken. And once when you are in that disrupted mode of crisis, whatever be the reasoning of that crisis, you get into an absorbing mode where you are already geared up fairly accurately to tide over the crisis and then you get into a recovery mode. So these two to three phases are very, very important. And the most important phase is to keep the disruption short-lived. Uh, obviously, if there are uh, external factors which are beyond your control, you can't do that. But at least with the controllable elements that are within the enterprise control, you should ensure that the disruption factor is minimized to that extent. And this again, I am just trying to give an overview as to what we do. Uh, I think uh, Raja Rajan also emphasized the need of getting into quality pathway in terms of orienting the overall healthcare spectrum. Quality and uh, objective uh, data-based uh, reviews is something, and as is evident on the chart, we have four qualifications. We have the ISO, we have the JCI, we are a green building, and obviously we undertook the NABL accreditation during the COVID times. All these four accreditations have surveillance layer at each and every layer where all this data is populated proactively. We look at outliers. There are huddle teams. There are multiple committees which get into this thing. This is, again, just an overview of the multiple committees which are conducted within the Apollo ecosystem at periodic intervals. This is, again, multidisciplinary team approach. Most of our clinical medical committees get represented by the consultants because they do contribute significantly well in terms of the overall thing. And obviously, it's a great blend of collective wisdom coming together and uh, looking at areas which can pose the risk for our patient and their families in terms of this thing. So this has really worked well. And this can be a good, strong structure, which can come as a handy tool preventing crisis management. And this is a typical risk assessment scoring chart, what we typically use at looking at the likelihood and looking at the consequences and the severity of the occurrence. So independent of that seven or eight parameters, which I highlighted in my first slide, as to the crisis may come in from any kind of uh, segment of the category of the industry that we talk about. And if we could rate them, and as we all understand, everything cannot be done overnight. And that's the reason it is very, very important to prioritize and then look at the severity and impact element. And because uh, people are obligating their lives and their families' life uh, in our hands, 
the basic ownership lies on us to ensure that my continuity planning in a hospital environment is not compromised uh, while any kind of crisis that we talk about. So lastly, uh, what we are looking at is uh, it is very important for any organization to start uh, capturing early warning signs. As we always know, uh, nothing happens overnight. There are always few feelers which you get and we need to be smart enough to understand what are those early warning signs and based on the uh, certain things, again, which are beyond like what happened during COVID. It's always to be mindful, thoughtful and luckily enough, I think most of the Apollo consultants were on the sitting committee of the national uh, panels and the committees which were looking at advisories for uh, COVID at that point of time. So those kind of insights are very helpful. Uh, we follow within the Apollo system uh, what is known as culture of safety. So this empowers that every senior leadership is accessible across the hospital at any point of time. Anybody has a brilliant suggestion which can ensure that my safety and uh, my satisfaction of my patient is safeguarded. They have every right and every obligation and a framework which provides them to give accessibility, give their inputs in terms of this kind of thing. And any mistakes, any honest mistakes which are made by the care providers in the working environment are encouraged to be reported. There are no punitive actions which we undertake in terms of those kind of reporting. And this is something which we encourage a lot. And that's the reason proactively as the concept what we use in healthcare is near misses. Any near misses may help us correct any potential damage which would have caused to the patient care activities are something which we monitor at periodic intervals and quality checks and balances. There are multiple tracer audits which are undertaken just to do a reality check and it gets into sampling check, but it gives a fair idea in terms of what are the challenges or what are the pain points or more importantly gives a surveillance that most of the pathways are being assured in a, a meaningful way. Disaster drills are something which we encourage very strongly and uh, we do it a little bit more smartly because we involve the public health authorities also. At periodic intervals, we go beyond the call of the duties and go beyond the enterprise value. We go and involve the public health authorities in creating what is known as a community drill and that really enhances awareness and it also gives us an opportunity to go back to the community and enhance the uh, awareness creation on how to respond to this kind of disasters. IT enabled solution is something which is uh, very strongly integrated in our hospital information system. Most of the solutions are uh, what is known as clinical decision support system, which is integrated with our consultants, with our nursing staff. So that really gives a proactive checks and balances in terms of ensuring that the clinical pathways are safeguarded and any untoward findings are really escalated as an uh, reporting at uh, periodic intervals. Training and capacity building, again, as I said earlier, is a moving target. At periodic intervals, you need to definitely look at building capacity of the staff. There are uh, clinical progression charts which are being undertaken for each and every category of the staff that we have on board. And we look at capacity buildup. And obviously, we look at what is known as subject matter expertise. Over a period of time, we have created those kind of cohort areas which have cohorted uh, staff who are subject matter expertise. And obviously, with more and more exposure, of the work norms, uh, obviously their skill sets gets enhanced. That's the way we look at it. Resource investment and upkeep is another important element ensuring readiness to any crisis management that we talk about. And what COVID has again taught us is an element of agility. Uh, at any point of time, any decisions that you need to do has to be taken quickly, fastly. That decision may undergo change very quickly or very sooner than you expected. But I think those kind of agilities and flexibility in, in terms of day-to-day -day activities and those kind of things are very, very important. And last and the most important being in public domain, obviously the public health authorities need to be in tune with whatever you are trying to venture into in terms of the overall activity. And the graphs just again gives the multiple elements of your uh, responses from a human behavior point of view. Obviously, under crisis management also, the ownership lies on all of us to be optimistic because only if you are optimistic and smiling, then only your patients will be optimistic and smiling in terms of the care that they are being reassured from the hospital setup and multiple other facets need to be safeguarded. So I will end my presentation with this beautiful saying of uh, Dr. Edward Deming, who says that it is not necessary to change as staying in business is not uh, compulsory. But as we understand, crisis management can really rip off businesses overnight. And that's the reason it is very, very important for each and every enterprise to have a sense of readiness, have a sense of proactiveness and catch it early on in, in terms of this thing. Because uh, if uh, early on it is caught up, uh, caught up, then obviously the sense of recovery is much more better and faster. Thank you very much for your attention and time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marate, for showing us the practical uh, aspects of building a resilient and uh, crisis-ready organization. I think that's a very important role to play 
both by the team members and every member of the healthcare has a stakeholder uh, responsibility to deliver this. Uh, I think a couple of minutes are left out. Uh, majorly, I don't see any questions because both the speakers have uh, really uh, shown the way in the right direction and explained the things in a very compact uh, period of time, but in great uh, aspect of showing the practical way of delivering it. So uh, before uh, I think closing this out, I'll just summarize uh, both the speakers, uh, a few points that I just noted down. So from uh, Raja Rajan, the key takeaways I feel are, how do we plan the VUCA Pro Prime strategy and the uh, focus aspect of building a resilient uh, structure through quality and risk management. Also, you touched upon the sustainable SDB, SDG goals, number three and nine, talking around the good health and well-being and also on building a resilient infra. And you showed us in the end that safety one and two are the ways of building it up. And a system level response is required for ending it up. From Mr. Marathi's side, I feel uh, he touched on the value of uh, certain key values is the value of enterprise risk assessment and management has a role to play with involvement of SME playing a key role. Success coming in from buying of uh, all stakeholders and definitely capacity building uh, when we talk of uh, crisis management or building a resilient infrastructure, capacity building has a greater role to play and deliver. And citing the example of pandemic with technology adoption as a one of the strategy and the practical benefits that Apollo got by adopting 24 by 7 is and the scale of uh, operation has really given a positive uh, benefits to the country and the strength of group level uh, operations while we came out with red book and pp category is really something which is remarkable for apollo group in the key learnings and the adoption at every hospital that happened out was the key success factor so uh, i would like to uh, thank both the speakers uh, for uh, giving this uh, great insight on this topic as well as all the participants for joining us today. Lastly, I would like to also thank Dr. Sanjay for uh, giving the, us the way forward for this interaction. And we look forward for uh, joining for further questions if anything is... Uh, Dr. Sanjay, if I'm... Uh, I don't think so. Nobody has any questions. So thank you for being over here. Thank you. We look forward to meeting you at the conference on 23rd and 24th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.